Hello, my name is Enrico Brauker, and welcome to my Honors Capstone, Electroadhesive Technologies for Prosthesis Applications. This project was done with Precision Systems Design Laboratory with my capstone advisors, Raventh Demerla and Professor Shori Avatar. So this project is part of a larger encompassing project, designing and fabricating an upper limb prosthetic. And one of the major issues that this project is trying to tackle is to improve um, the capabilities of the prosthetic in terms of human muscle. Um, so currently in literature and in the market, all of the designs fall short of a lot of important metrics in terms of torque and speed. And this is mostly due to um, some of the factors that affect uh, torque density, power density, and specific power. And that's specifically in transmissions. So why these transmissions and these prostheses do not match these human muscle capabilities is because they don't necessarily scale well uh, when they're put in the context of a small assembly in a in let's say a prosthetic hand and this can uh, this coupled with limited degrees of freedom and range of motion can result in compensatory motion of joints which can lead to a series of health health issues um, and it's just inconvenient for the user. Um, and one of the solutions that we are trying to come up with for this problem is to implement electroadhesives. Electroadhesives uh, provide a low power, uh, lightweight, and high force density solution uh, to be used as locking mechanisms or couplers in prosthesis transmissions, as well as a variety of other functionalities. Uh, another reason why these are so attractive is because they're highly configurable in geometry, size, structure. So a little bit of background. Uh, the working principle of electroadhesives is that you have, it's essentially a glorified capacitor. You have oppositely charged electrodes that either indu that induce an electric field across either themselves or uh, a neighboring substrate. And this results in a stress that, when put in shear mode, can result in a shear force. Currently in literature, a lot of electroadhesives are used for haptics, climbing robots, exoskeletons, uh, modular robots, just a variety of different applications. And it really exemplifies how versatile these devices really are. So the electroadhesive essentially comes in two main configurations, the first of which is the coplanar configuration. This includes a series of interdigitated teeth, which um, essentially utilize the fringe electric field to induce, an to induce a pressure over a device or target substrate. As for the double-sided configuration, this is more closely related to a conventional capacitor where the electrodes induce an electric field across themselves and that results in a pressure that can be used for a shear mode as you can see in this in this diagram so what's currently out there uh, in terms of state of the art the highest performing electroadhesive today is that of ronin hinchet it's used as a, a haptic feedback device for vr to simulate holding objects it's in the double-sided configuration and it has an impressive shear force density of 210 kilopascals and a rather low operating voltage of 300 volts as compared to most other designs. That's most, uh, due, mostly due to the fact that this is a uh, double-sided configuration and that electric field is very direct and induced across itself. A couple drawbacks is one, one of the electrodes needs to be grounded this in the context of degrees of freedom can limit the range of motion so it might not be a super attractive solution for especially rotary mechanisms where you need both of the electrodes moving with respect to the prosthetic itself one way to go about fixing this issue is to implement a interdigitated or a coplanar design where the electrodes are self-contained uh, within the device and they don't move with respect to one another. The highest performing design with this configuration is that of Choi. It is currently used as a soft gripper. Uh, it has a significantly less shear force density of 33 kilopascals 
and operates at a significantly higher voltage at one kilovolt. This is mostly due to the fringe electric field being the main mechanism for applying pressure. A couple of drawbacks are, as I said earlier, it's a little weak compared to the other design and a lot of applications and prostheses might require a higher shear force density to be functional. Um, and as well as a more nuanced drawback is because it's inducing an electric field through a neighboring substrate, you have charge that needs to continuously accumulate and if you have relative motion uh, fast enough, it can result in a loss of, of pressure. So my main objective with this project is to leverage the, the winning characteristics of these designs, specifically the materials that they use and the electro geometries and dimensions and how those uh, decisions are informed and accommodate those in the context of a prosthetic. Specifically, uh, alter the electro geometry and meet this force density requirement for our specific application and then essentially change the geometry so that it fits in our prosthetic uh, transmission architecture. Another main design driver is making sure that this device is readily uh, manufactured in-house. We don't want to outsource anything because that can lead to um, delays in prototyping and so on and so forth. So how I've approached this problem, I've done a, a in-depth dielectric materials research, which essentially is what's covering the device and allows essentially this electric field to be transmitted without charge being transmitted as well. So a couple of major design drivers in picking this material is ensuring that it has a high dielectric constant in order to permit the electric field and a high breakdown voltage because this voltage scales uh, the voltage scales with shear force density, so we want to maximize that. Some other considerations, uh, good mechanical properties. We want it to be uh, wear resistant and relatively elastic, especially when using it in, in applications that require it to change shape. In terms of electron materials, really anything that's highly conductive, and that can be contingent as well on how much flexibility you want. You can use conductive polymers or you can go the more conventional route with copper and aluminum. So in terms of electrogeometry, an uh, in-depth study on dimensional analysis has been done and essentially it is analogous to that of a typical capacitor. You want, there are a couple of key metrics that you want to consider when designing these. You want to minimize the thickness of the dielectric cover Essentially, you have that same one over D relationship as you would in a capacitor, um, as well as the ratio of the width and spacing of the electrodes. So you want to basically have as little space between these electrode fingers as possible, as similar to the, the, that same relationship. Um, and then another more nuanced uh, relationship that you want is you want the boundary edge length of these electrodes to be maximized so that charge accumulates and you essentially maximize the electric field for a given area. Some other considerations, um, the substrate thickness scales with shear force density as well, so that's a consideration, as well as the permittivity of the substrate. So how well does that, does that charge um, accumulate or how well does that electric field get transmitted through the substrate? So for my initial design concept, I'm using a 2,000 copper foil. This is because it's readily machinable and I can do it in-house with in the Dudestat Fabrication Laboratory on their Bantam PCB mill. Um, as well as the dielectric that I've chosen is the Piezotech. I'm not even trying to pronounce this. This is uh, the same dielectric that Choi used in his coplanar configuration, the haptic feedback device that I had discussed earlier. It's shown that it is by far the highest performing material out there in terms of dielectrics for this application. And to couple that, I've sourced a fabric reinforced silicone rubber that has a high temperature, that has a high melting point. That is because this piezotech is thermally cured and we need to be able to withstand high curing temperatures. In order to scale up the voltage, as I discussed earlier about uh, the voltage scaling with shear force density, 
I'm using a high voltage boost converter and this will essentially use the same power supply as the, the prosthesis, most likely a battery. Um, and given that it's really low power on the scale of milliwatts, we won't need any other external power sources and this voltage should, should scale relatively nicely. In order to ensure that this power isn't too much and it's safe for the user, uh, I'm going to implement a LM317 voltage regulator or more, uh, more correct terminology would be a current regulator. This uh, comes in the form of just a simple module uh, and yeah. So for the design parameters, I, uh, starting point is going to be 350 volts for the supply voltage. This is mostly going off of the, the hinge design as well with the haptic feedback at 300 volts. I figured that would be a, a pretty good starting point. We can always change that. Uh, electrode dimensions, this is informed by the dimensional analysis that we had gone over earlier, as well as this dielectric thickness. All of these dimensions are pretty typical in literature in terms of how they've been implemented. And it's, it's been a winning formula, so that's a good starting point for us. And this device profile is essentially just um, for the sake of fabrication testing. It's not the final dimensions that are going to be implemented in the prosthetic, but it's a good starting point. This predicted force density here is, is, was found by essentially acknowledging all of the performance metrics of existing designs in prior art and interpolating them with respect to our current dimensions and parameters and getting that related pressure. So for future work, um, I plan on pushing the limits of this fabrication method to essentially increase the density of the fingers per a given area of the device. This will maximize the shear force density that I can get out of it. Um, that is contingent on a lot of things, including the error of the PCB mill and the size of the end mill that I'm using. Um, so once I have a optimized fabrication driven design, I will complete the complete a functioning prototype using the dielectric and a whole working electrical subsystem as well. And then once I do that, I plan on making electrodes with different geometries and essentially verifying and characterizing these devices and seeing exactly how do the relationships between the geometry and shear force work out. And, and then once that's once that's done, I plan on implementing the design into a process into our specific use for the prosthesis. This would include essentially changing some of the overarching dimensions and uh, mounting and what have you in the in the prosthetic. A little bit more of a higher concept improvement would be to implement. AC, this is because with DC, you tend to get a charge that accumulates in the device and that can result in residual shear force that's being applied when you turn the device off. When you implement AC, this effectively gets mitigated because you're constantly changing the current, so you don't allow charge to build up. And that'll help with uh, speed, with ditch, discharging and charging times. So here are my references. Uh, I would like to thank Raventh and Shoria for all their guidance as my capstone advisors, as well as the Deuterstadt Fabrication Laboratory for all their help with um, manufacturing. Thank you for watching.